Good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to be here today to have a conversation with you about my oral history project titled Call to Glory. Uh, the Convair B-58 Hustler helped win the Cold War. Before I go into uh, the remarks that I have prepared, I wanted to answer the gentleman's question about the origin of my name. Paulo Lacos is indigenous to one area of the world, Sparta. If you're familiar with the story of the 300 Spartans, or perhaps you've seen the movie, as I always tell my students on the first day of class, then you know all you need to know about your instructor and what's ahead in the ensuing quarter. <laughs> so uh, it's neither Greek nor Hawaiian, it's Spartan. But in any case, I uh, would like to take a few moments here uh, this morning to first of all share with you my impressions and my conclusions that arose from this oral history project. Second, I wanted to share with you some personal photographs that are being uh, allowed to be shown in public for the first time that came from my research from the defense systems operators, pilots, and navigators that flew this magnificent aircraft during the Cold War. And then also I have brought a set of copies of the book for those of you that would like to purchase a signed copy. I have them available after the presentation. And I also have a few other little goodies and souvenirs that I want to give to each of you who are so kind to come here this morning, some commemorative bookmarks and cards from the book as well. So, what I like to do with the conversation is to always begin with a series of questions. And usually there are four of them that I like to ask when talking about this particular project. And the first question I would ask is, I'm sure that most of you here have a vivid recollection, perhaps personal or through watching film or reading books about the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, yes? But how many of you here know the story behind the story? the difference maker in that situation? I imagine not many. That's one of the questions that is answered in my book. Second question, how many of you here are familiar with or have seen the movie or read the book titled Failsafe? Maybe some of you saw the made-for-TV remake in the year 2000 that featured George Clooney. Sticking with the theme of cinema and television, how many of you who watched classic sci-fi television in the 60s or maybe classic sci-fi movies in the big screen remember the encapsulated cockpit as part of the standard operating uh, features for interplanetary spacecraft as well as high-tech aircraft? Anyone? Of course. And then finally I would ask all of you, I tell my students that's the sound of commerce. That's the sound of commerce. I live near MCAS Miramar, and I always say that's the sound of freedom. So we get to enjoy both. It's a great blessing. So my last question is, if I tell you the date, November 22nd, 1963, invariably, I'm sure most, if not all of you, will recall JFK the day that our 35th U.S. President was assassinated, but how many of you here can tell me what was the subject of his last speech that he made that morning in Fort Worth before he journeyed on to Dallas? I imagine not many of you can. Well, the answer to those questions and many, many other topics are found in my book, Call to Glory. And obviously the unifying factor is the Convair B-58 Hustler. It was the difference maker in the Cuban Missile Crisis, for reasons that I would like to talk about in the context of our Q&A session this morning. It was also the aircraft that was used to depict the fictional Vindicator bomber that was used to deliver the nuclear ordnance in both the big screen and TV version of Failsafe. And of course the encapsulated cockpit was designed and developed and perfected for the B-58. Finally, when we look at the public remarks made by JFK on that fateful day of November 22nd, 1963, in his last speech in Fort 
Fort Worth, Texas, which, by the way, for the residents of Fort Worth, they regarded it as a day of triumph. The people in Dallas regarded it as a day of tragedy. He spoke in glowing terms about the Convair B-58 Hustler, how important it was as a strategic asset in our national defense, how it was the best bomber in the world. I always found that rather interesting, uh, considering that it was the, the critical asset in the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, having said that, I wanted to mention to you that the unifying theme of Call to Glory is that the B-58 Hustler exemplifies the proper notion of economy and national defense. That is, when a nation is able to develop and deploy a weapon system that is so powerful that it never has to be used in anger, then from a finance perspective, that is, looking at return on investment, that nation has received the highest ROI that it can on that military asset because it's a it has been able to achieve victory. Victory through deterrence to keeping the enemy at bay, to keeping them wondering about they should learn to step carefully. The B-58, as it turns out, in its short service life, not only set records that still stand to this day, but equally important, and what is, gets lost in the story, is that it was a major economic and technology driver, producing enormous benefits that continued in the ensuing generations of not only high-tech military aircraft, but also in commercial aircraft as well, which we can talk about. In addition to that, during the time of its deployment, it served to be able to significantly reduce the risk for the overall SAC bomber fleet. And concurrent with reducing the risk profile for the entire fleet, it actually increased the firepower and the success rate potential for all of the bombers in the event of an emergency war order. Certainly these are high attributes for any military asset uh, that is deployed. Now, when we look at other aspects about it, uh, as I referenced in my uh, opening questions, it turns out that the movie failed safe and the events of the Cuban Missile Crisis actually gave rise to some very interesting urban legends that still you find in uh, some, well, I would venture to say in some public school classrooms, uh, where history and uh, mythology tend to be mixed, but it's kind of fun. It was interesting to deconstruct that in the context of my work. And then also, I was very privileged to have as, uh, an entire chapter in this book from the last pilot, actually defense systems operator, that uh, had to use the encapsulated com cockpit and had to bail out at high altitude. So his story is found in there. It's very inspiring, very interesting, I think, uh, when we look at that. But I want to say that one of the most interesting things that came about in doing this research was on two different levels. First and foremost, the B-58 exemplified not only the highs of this decade that's come to be known as the soaring 60s, but also it exemplified the lows. And specifically what I refer to is the rather anticlimactic way in which the decade ended. As I recall, there was an 18-month period during 1970-71 when the B-58 Hustler was retired. Public funding for the supersonic transport was canceled, and the manned expedition to Mars that had been on the books since the mid to late 60s was canceled. And as we're going to find out in this book, it was part of a whole systemic shift part of a whole systemic shift in a change in public policy that had consequences that have continued to have repercussions to this very day and very hour. And so it's interesting to look at it from that prism, but perhaps I think even more important is the people that were involved. We often are very privileged to honor the veterans who have served in World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and so forth. 
But oftentimes there are people that have sort of been lost in the shadows, and the people that flew the B-58 Hustler, known as the Black Sheep Squadron of SAG, were equally important in our history, and that's another reason why I wrote this book, was to pay tribute to them. Because like the ancient Spartans that are a part of my heritage, like the men in the Alamo, which is also part of my heritage, because my mother's from Texas, these men that flew these aircraft were called to glory, knowing at a moment's notice that they would be asked to do the unthinkable. And they gave every bit of themselves as others did. And so that's another reason why I wrote this book. And so what I'd like to do uh, as I open it up to q and I'd like to pass around this little picture album here that I brought. And it has some photographs that were given to me. You'll see there some of the photographs of the best bomber crews that flew the B-58. And some other neat photographs there that actually debunk some of the myths about the B-58, which again I'd like to talk about in, in Q&A. And then there's some other neat pictures in there that for those of you that have a San Diego connection, I think you'll recognize a very important rocket uh, that is associated with this area that you'll see it parked next to the B-58. So with that, I'd like to continue our conversation by throwing it open to all of you for any questions that you may have. Yes, sir. Can you be more specific? For instance, they made the Skyhawk a nuclear bomber by inventing cross bombing, and they used lay down bombing, and uh, then the normal one would be like a B 61 where you could air detonate. Did they do anything different as a result of having this case of bullet? The question was, if I'm going to summarize your question, if I may, was basically how did the inclusion of the B 58 as deployment alter? tactics and strategies for uh, in the event of a nuclear uh, war order. Is that correct? Okay. So, based on the research that was done and the testimony given to me, the B-58 was designed to fly at supersonic speeds as it approached the target area. And then it would slow down and drop to low altitude. And it could fly at a, at a low altitude and then basically it had not one, not two, not three, not four, but five nukes that you can see externally strapped here. And the centerline weapon was the biggest one. It had basically five times the megatonnage of the other four. So what was done is that the B-58, their targets were uh, in large part uh, all in western, the western part of the Soviet Union. And they used drag chutes. There, there was no drone applications like with the Hound Dog that was used in the B-52 later. So essentially, they would drop down to a low altitude. They would d deploy their their five nukes to the various targets using drag chutes, and then use their supersonic afterburners to get out. And that was the plan. It is also uh, something that I confirmed that there was regarded as a safe place. A safe as anything could be in such a conflict, perhaps but in the area of Turkey. That was one area that was uh, viewed as a place to either bail out at high altitude using the encapsulated cockpits, or hopefully to be able to land the bird. But I can tell you that the B-58 had a tremendous impact on the whole deployment of SAC because what it did was it reduced the measure of risk at the standard deviation of, uh, in, in terms of uh, loss of aircraft as well as personnel. It lowered that standard deviation for the whole fleet. And it wasn't so much that the B-58 was a better aircraft than any other in the fleet, but it's the combination of those assets. And that's really what comes about in this research. That when we evaluate military assets, it's not about looking at one aircraft versus another, or one platform versus another on a standalone basis, but how do they work in conjunction with a larger strategy? The B-58 was enormous in that regard. Other questions? Yes, sir. You've got to tell us about the Cuban Missile Crisis. What would you like to know about the Cuban well, Missile Crisis? In that. Well, in my book, I was going to share with you that I have on page 53 a whole deconstruction of the nuclear arsenal for both sides, for the United States and for the Soviet Union in October of 1962. So some of you might see for the very first time what that deconstruction looks like. And what's going to happen in that is you'll notice that the B-58 had more bomber weapons than the entire Soviet Air Force. More bomber weapons 
than our own submarine launched and intercontinental ballistic missiles from, from land base. So it was a formidable, formidable asset. So in that regard, it equaled or surpassed the Soviets. Number two, with regard to the Cuban Missile Crisis, is that with having five nukes as opposed to two, which is what the B-52 had, that there were more ordered combinations of being able to deploy that. If you use, for example, give you a little mathematical review here. If you use the factorial function for two, there's only two combinations of being able to deploy your nukes. But with a B-58, each 58 with five nukes is able to have 120 possible combinations of deploying the weapons. So the Soviets had no way of being able to stop that because they didn't know where it was going to be coming from. So in combination with the others, that was a decisive asset. But here's where the B-58 came into play. Do you all recall when the U-2 was shot down? Of course, the question was, well, what are we going to do? Soviets have shot down one of our planes. We need to go in. We need to take them out. We did something very different. And it sent us a very strong message. And this is where the turning point occurred. There was a B-58 that was outfitted for photo reconnaissance. It was called a quick pod. And so what ended up happening was that the, a, a B-58, a single B-58 was deployed over Cuba to continue the photo reconnaissance that were being done by the U-2 spy planes. And it sent a very strong message to our adversary. First and foremost, we're still watching you. We still know what you're doing. But second of all, that aircraft also said, we can also take you out anytime we want with a single aircraft. And I will tell you that in the course of my interview, I can't disclose who it was, I spoke with the crew that their assignment, if the war order had been given, was to take out Cuba. One, one B-58, one strike, and I confirmed it with three different independent sources. It was a difference maker. It was a huge difference maker because it wasn't so much the B-58 itself, but it, it just changed the whole game plan because it, was a, it created diversification, the Russians greater firepower. I'm sorry? Did the Russians know all this? Did the Soviet Union know of this? Yes. How did they know? Well, there are two ways. First and foremost, one of the things that, that was done was that, and I confirmed this with uh, five different uh, uh, B-58 pilots, is that there were a lot of practice exercises that were done here in California and off the coast. Many of them were war game exercises against uh, F-102s, F-104s, and what ended up happening was these B-58 pilots were instructed to actually uh, made themselves known to the Soviet trawlers that were patrolling off the coast of California. And what it let them know was that the B-58s were able to successfully destroy in a war game exercise the targets that were being done here domestically. So they were well aware and they, and they made sure that they telegraphed that because they took the, uh, the countermeasures off uh, to make sure that the Soviets knew that. That was one way. And then the second, of course, was in the context of the crisis itself, that uh, we were not deterred. But instead of, of uh, responding with a military strike, what we did is we sent the aircraft over, and of course they know uh, that the next one may not just have photo recon equipment, it might have uh, some, shall we say, as the British say, little buckets of sunshine. Other questions? Yes, sir. Uh I understand it was retired when they had wing cracking problems, is that correct? Well, not entirely correct, if I may. The B-58 had what's called a unibody structure, much like this aircraft that I have here on my lapel pin, that's the RAF Vulcan. It's a Delta Wing aircraft also deployed at the same time, subject of a previous book that I wrote. And these unibody aircraft they had greater stability because of their delta wing design, but they had a finite fatigue life. You know, unlike the B-52, which has been rebuilt numerous times because you could unbolt the wings and re-engine the aircraft, you could not do that with the B-58, you could not do it with the Vulcan. So as a result of that, there was... 
there was a knowledge that due to the unibody structure, there was a finite fatigue life. So it wasn't so much that there was cracks per se that caused the fleet to be grounded, it's just that, that was, they were cognizant. But I will say to your point, the B-58, similar to the, to the Vulcan aircraft, by the way, in my book, I do a comparison between the two, because there's a lot of interesting similarities that we can learn that because of that finite fatigue light, because of its design, it required nuanced or specialized maintenance. See, there was only 116 uh, uh, B-58s that were built, 80 that were actually in deployment. The Vulcan aircraft had a slightly lower number, and both of them had highly specialized maintenance that required having to uh, make corrections and take care of those things that you attributed to fatigue and, and the frequent takeoff uh, and landing cycles. So that was a concern. And one of the things that I address in this book is that because of that factor, they would have had to alter the mission for the B-58 to do what they did with the Vulcan aircraft. The British changed the Vulcan aircraft to a nighttime aircraft and they limited its uh, uh, takeoff and landing cycles. So, that was a factor that was coming into play as well by 1970. Sir? What is the maximum uh, altitude and operational range of the 58? There's a range, there's a great variance about that, but let me give you the published numbers and the numbers that I was able to uh, get. Um, I was able to determine that the highest range that I'm aware of was 85,000 feet. They were able to take it as high as 85,000. Now, as far as the uh, radius is concerned, and I have the, the published statistics in there, that if you're talking about uh, a radius with one refueling, probably about close to 5,000 miles, but of course it depends on the speed, whether you're flying at supersonic speed, whether you're flying at, at uh, uh, subsonic, so it, it varied on that. But to put it in greater context, it did not have the loiter time of a B-52, so it was never on air alert. The B-58 was a ground alert aircraft only. And so what happened was during the years that we had airborne bombers at all time, those were B-52s, because they had the loiter time, they could have replacement groups. B-58 didn't have that. But what the B-58 had was that the B-58 could get, could actually strike the target in the same amount of time that a B-52 that's already at the perimeter could. So in other words, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, the B-52 is crowding the Soviet radars. The B-58 is launched from two bases, Little Rock and Bunker Hill, now known as Grissom, could get to those positive control points very, very fast, and then they could reach the target in equal or faster time than the B-52s. So it was basically uh, what you would call uh, an aircraft that would be used, you know, coming after the first wave or in conjunction with the first wave, but not based on an air alert. Does that help? Yes. Yes, sir. Did they do aerial refueling? Yes, they did. Now, the economics for that are kind of interesting. Uh, it's been reported, and I did confirm that with a B-58, you required one KC-135 to refuel one B-58, whereas with a B-52, you could get Two KC-135s could refuel three B-52s. So that may have been part of the um, cost accounting numbers that went into the, uh, into the decision there. You talked about altitude, how about speed? Oh, the speed was about 1,350 miles an hour. So it was very fast. It had the, the speed and the maneuverability of a fighter aircraft, but it had obviously the striking power of a bomber. But it was regarded as a medium range bomber, not a, not a long range uh, like the B-52 or its predecessor, the B-36. Did it have a unique engine? Did it have unique engines? It did have special engines that were, that were designed. They used a whole new engine design for the B-58, uh, which are discussed in detail here in terms of how it absorbed the shock waves. And in addition to that, uh, new structural designs, they are also new materials, and other such factors that became a standard for later aircraft. 
So that was the reason why the cost figures, and I break it all down for you here, why the B-50 was regarded as being so much more expensive than, say, its predecessor bombers. It was a pioneering aircraft. And a lot of the things that were done with the B-58 became standard for other later generation aircraft. Basically, and this is not to be pejorative about it, but I will tell you that the B-52 was nothing more, and I don't mean that, again, to be pejorative, it's basically a faster version of the B-29. Had intercontinental range, could carry more, great aircraft, I, you know, not, not denigrating its service record, but a lot of the economics and, and, and the manufacturing and technology, you didn't have to do as much in the way of upfront investment like you did with the B-58. So. Was that engine used in any other aircraft? It, I, I, it's my understanding that it was later used in other aircraft, particularly in testing. Yes. It was a J-79. That's it, yes. F yes, sir. Uh, the guy in the back, you called him the defense system officer? Defense, d d defense systems operator, yes, sir. Operator. DSO. Uh, what, what, what did he do and what was his capability? Can you say that? Yes, I can, and it's all on the pages of my book. Uh, but uh, basically, the defense systems operator there had the role of assisting the pilot and being able to uh, obviously uh, deploy or you know, to utilize the, um, the Vulcan cannon and then also to help the pilot make sure that the ordinance was delivered. And in the event, uh, you know, of, of uh, shall we say, catastrophic event, perhaps be able to, to step in at some point. How about countermeasures? The B-58 did not really utilize uh, countermeasures. It, it really regard, relied on its speed and its low-level flying capability. It had some countermeasures. It had some countermeasures in the center pod here. It had some. It had some countermeasures, but it wasn't like a loaded with countermeasures as some of the other aircraft were. So it had a minimal amount. Uh, in comparison to say like the B-52s or others, they didn't carry as much because you know they didn't have a lot of space. It's a small, it's a fairly small aircraft when you look at it. That pod had room for three operators. The pod that hung underneath the B-58. Yes. Fortunately, it never got far enough along the belt to actually fly. That it was probably the dog and mission. Yeah, it's an interesting aircraft. It was very versatile. It was very, the, the gentleman here points out that, that the versatility of the aircraft was greatly enhanced by this center pod that could expand the number of countermeasures. That's what enabled it to be so effective in the Cuban Missile Crisis to be used as a photo recon. I should also tell you something else that's not generally known, although I discuss it in Call to Glory, and that is it was used for humanitarian efforts. How many of you recall the earthquakes that hit Alaska in 1964 through 68? You all recall those great earthquakes? What do you think was dispatched up there to take photo recon? It was the B-58. But it's interesting because what you find out is that it was a very good aircraft for that, but it didn't uh, have the capabilities, say like an SR-71, to uh, accomplish the same goals. And so that's why it was never fully moved uh, into that role. But it certainly had the versatility to, to be able to do that, and it served as well particularly at the most important time in history. We talked about the B-70, and you write much about the B-58 used as a chase plane, although it only flew 1,000 miles an hour slower than the B-70, but it was used as a chase plane without a network. Question on the statement here was made a great observation about the XB-70 Valkyrie. All of you remember that wonderful aircraft? Of course, but a wonderful aircraft. Also emblematic of the soaring 60s. The B-58 was indeed used as a chase plane on occasion uh, with that aircraft. And it's interesting, I have a whole section in Call to Glory that talks about the various aircraft that were built during that period. The Skybolt missile, for example, the XB-70 Valkyrie that did not get fully deployed. And uh, there were some consequences to be paid for that, which I enumerated and quantified. The B-58 was actually able to be deployed and was able to actually 
have a distinguished service life. Unfortunately, with the other assets, we were not able to fully realize their benefits. It's ironic because Skybolt was canceled on the day that it achieved operational readiness and capability. And uh, the B-70 never reached full production. Supposedly, it was going to be uh, carried on to in an R&D role, but that never really uh, was fully deployed either. Yeah, it's, it, was, it was a great aircraft, but unfortunately, it never realized its full, uh, its full potential. Well, it's interesting about politics. Uh, I addressed that as well in Call to Glory. As a very good friend of mine once said to me, politics makes liars of us all. Politics makes liars of us all. And so when we read about the underlying shifts in public policy and sentiment that led to the premature retirement of the B-58, the stoppage of the XB-70, Skybolt, the cessation of interplanetary spaceflight, uh, and other such factors, uh, we see the dark shadow of politics entering in. And it's really sad because history shows that when a nation starts to cease pushing the knowledges, the, the frontiers of knowledge and exploration, and they start to look inward as opposed to outward, when they cease to fully take the adversary seriously, when they say they're going to destroy you, the nation is placed at great risk. The nation is placed at great risk, and that's a subject that is uh, discussed rather explicitly here. Yes, sir? A rotary cannon? It was uh, in the event that they were engaged, uh, you know, with uh, any interceptors that tried to chase after them. Tail. Tail. Usually the B-50 was flying so fast that <laughs> that's the only way you were going to catch them. Yes, sir. Uh, wasn't there a Soviet, a high uh, uh, Soviet uh, that in, in the top echelon that knew the strengths and weaknesses of the Soviet Union? And he defected to the uh, to the United States and uh, gave the information that what what Soviet could, could or couldn't do, and and then that, that led to Kennedy. Well, as a matter of fact, I have the names of some of the people that you just mentioned. They're in the footnotes uh, on page 53 and 54 of my book that talks about that, that confirmed about. Uh, the fact that we had overwhelming force. We had an enormous advantage on every measure uh, in terms of, of, of what, what our Bruce capabilities were. We have nuclear teeth, as I remember. Yes. That's why he backed down. Yes, exactly right. And one of the things that I do in this book is, I don't know how many of you love to play chess. I love playing chess. I use it as a teaching tool. The Soviet pastime was chess. They had the greatest chess players in the world. And I use the, the analogy of, of chess because I use game theory to help present my thesis and the themes that I have in the book. And basically in chess, things you have to remember, combination strategies are the soul of chess. Combinations of different pieces and assets. The B-58 was a crucial piece, but here's another point. In chess, you have to display overwhelming force and the willingness to use it. You've got to be decisive. If you play passive, the adversary will take advantage of that. And that's the interesting point, is that when you were playing with the Soviet Union, you had to make decisive moves. Because one can argue in the context of the chess game, and I just leave it to the reader's, uh, not imagination, but they can connect the dots, the Cuban Missile Crisis arose because of a series of earlier missteps showing passivity when you needed to show decisiveness. That was a mistake. Like Theodore Roosevelt. Walk softly, talk softly, but carry a big stick. You said it very well, sir. You quoted Theodore Roosevelt saying, speak softly and carry a big stick. Yes, sir. Back down to the technical level here. The F-4. Listed as a Mach 2.1 aircraft. Yes, great aircraft. The only time I ever hit Mach 2 was on a 
totally clean bird on a test flight. Mm -hmm. If anything hanging on it, that dropped down. Is that the case with the B-58? It says about 2.1. I hit 1,400 one time for a clean bird. The one that flew, the one that flew the, the, the 85,000 feet, the test pilot that told me it was a clean bird. Okay, so. Yeah, so if it was, yeah, so if you're talking about with, with uh, fully armament, like it's displayed here on the cover, we're talking, what's that? The doomsday load. The doomsday load. We're probably talking 60, 60 to 65,000 feet, probably, as a service ceiling. I'm sorry? They had afterburning engines, you better believe it. And that actually was shown in the movie Failsafe. In the, in the opening sequence of the movie Failsafe, when you see the Vindicator bomber, AKA the B-58, it shows them going to afterburners. It's a beautiful aircraft. I'm sorry? My understanding is the range of what the full speed on it was about 1300, 1300, maybe max 1350, depending on uh, flight conditions. But they could, it could really haul. The thing is, though, is that when it traveled at that speed, it required more, more refueling. So that's why, like I said, one KC-135 for one B-58, and that that played into the into the equation. Yes, sir. It had the pod under the fuel tank, question the pod under the fuel tank. That had reconnaissance, some countermeasures, and also extra fuel. And then what could happen is they would drop it when they had used when they used them all in the context of a combat situation. And by the way, that when they were doing their war games exercise off the coast of California, so that uh, the Soviet trawlers, quote unquote trawlers, fishing for information, uh, they made sure that they saw all of that. Yes, sir. I'm getting a bit confused about the airspeed of the airplane. You had mentioned 1,300 miles per hour. Is that with all of that stuff attached to the fuselage? Yes. Yes. So the all, all of the, the, the speeds that were quoted were with uh, uh, fully loaded. But then again, as I noted earlier, to sustain that, you gotta use a lot of fuel. So you can do it for short bursts. Yes, sir? What special fuel did they use? Gosh, I'm not sure. Probably it was the Metoxa that I drink. <laughs> I was wondering if it's like, like they use in the X-1. Yeah, like the SR-71? Yeah. That's, uh, I'm not aware that, I don't believe it was a special fuel like that. I mean, because of, uh, because of the fact that it's such a large uh, deployment of aircraft, there were two wings, each comprised of 40 birds, and they did not they, they did not have the specialized fuel that we associate with the SR-71 Blackbirds. Yes, sir. We didn't test our using boron fuel. Mm -hmm. Extremely expensive. Yes, the gentleman mentions about using boron fuel. Extremely expensive. I do want to mention something here. Uh, this is an interesting question, and that is that we look at cost, cost accounting figures, or price. One of the things I teach to my students at the University of California is you need to learn to distinguish between price and value. And what I would say, and I tell my students this, yes, even at the University of California, I tell them that liberty and freedom are of incalculable value. It's not to be bargained or compromised based on cost accounting figures. So this is something that you have to think about very, very carefully in the context of a broader holistic strategy. It's not just about numbers. It's not just about numbers. Yes, sir. I, I was just reading about Wikipedia, about, about the airplane. Uh, first of all, it was apparently a pretty dangerous airplane to fly. They lost 22% of them in about 10 years. So that really cut down the fleet. Also, it was extraordinarily expensive. It cost three times as much to fly and maintain. When General LeMay flew in it once, he didn't like it. He said, get rid of it. It's too expensive, and uh, it's too small. That was the thing. Let me address those criticisms, because they're all, they're all covered in call to glory and Go ahead. I got, I got one more thing. Go one ahead. more criticism, yes. Uh, one more criticism. You must be an attorney by training, sir. By, by the fact that... He is. I got his business card. Okay. All right, so... Uh, the fact that they quit using it, quit flying it, 
actually says a lot for the government because they realized they didn't need it. It was replaced by the FB-111 to start off with, but it was uh, the fact that nothing really has happened untoward since then. It, it hasn't like our whole defense collapsed because we lost the B-58. They took out a very, very expensive thing that was difficult to fly and killed a lot of people uh, to make you know, theoretically better. Let me, let me address your points here, because uh, these are very popular misconceptions that the gentleman has shared with us, and I'd like to address them. First and foremost, the B-58 had a high accident rate. Yes, 22% of the aircraft uh, were destroyed in accidents, but keep in mind, it was a pioneering aircraft. It was, and, it, and as it is with all new pioneering aircraft, you take the slings and arrows. The fact of the matter is, other supersonic aircraft that were deployed at the same time had a much higher fatality rate. For example, the F-100 was also deployed at the same time, had a 47% accident rate. The SR-71 had a 37% accident rate. The Vulcan had a, uh, an accident rate of 16%. So in the context of other comparable aircraft that I show in the book, the B-58's high accident rate really is not quite as, as bad as I said. Second, it did require a very specialized skill set. Only the best of the best could fly the B-58. Next, the issue of cost is the difference between what I just said. You're talking about price versus value. And the point is, on price versus value, that those cost accounting figures that you quoted from Wikipedia, uh, in point of fact, ignore all of the economic benefits and technology driver benefits that came out of the B-58. And then I would also point out to you that that same criticism was used on the Apollo moon expedition, saying it was just a $10 million rock collecting expedition. Well, it was a lot more than that, as we know. You just look around here at this wonderful museum and you can see what the return has been. Same thing with the B-58. Next. General LeMay had a propensity to go for intercontinental long-range aircraft. That was his bias, to be sure, and that was reflected in that. But the fact of the matter is, the B-58 answered the call to glory. The next item I would mention to you is that I would respectfully disagree that the retirement of the B-58 uh, did not have bad consequences. It had disastrous consequences, because what you ended up doing is you put the entire burden on the B-52, and it was not really suitable for that. The 1970s was a time when our nation was on the defensive. The enemy, Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, I should say, was on the attack. They were moving very, very aggressively. They used the strategic arms limitation talks as an opportunity to gain an advantage, a quantitative advantage, in terms of launchers and weapons. The B-58 was used as a concession in those SALT talks. Had the B-58 been allowed to remain in some service capacity, I doubt very much whether the Soviet Union would have been as aggressive as they were. But here's one more point, counterpoint, and that is that the B-58 could have provided a much easier transition rather than the stop and start that went from, we're going to build the B-1 bomber to not build the B-1 bomber, maybe we're going to build the stealth bomber, maybe not. There was a gap there, and so by the time the early 80s rolled around, we were in a catch-up mode. Obviously, we caught up and surpassed. But I would respectfully point out that I think that, that the B-58, that its retirement, the so-called cost savings, and I quantify it in there, was regarded as being penny-wise and pound-foolish because it ignored the opportunity costs and the benefits that came out of that. And I would just say that that was the mistake that a lot of public policy makers make. Other questions? Well, obviously I'm very passionate about this, um, but I match my passion with research. And I would invite you all uh, to please uh, stay a bit here. I've got some copies for you. I also want to give you some commemorative bookmarks as well.